the UK has a choice whether or not to participate in each new proposal on policing and criminal justice. That is for the new, uh, new decisions that have been made post-Lisbon. And the UK have very constructively chosen to contribute to many of those and to participate, uh, for instance, uh, in legislation concerning trafficking of human beings. And UK has been very constructive and been a very good uh, and engaged uh, player here. And we hope, of course, that uh, that will continue, that uh, the UK will still be a valuable driver of progress, of change, of new ideas, of expertise, helping to set direction and strengthen cooperation in the field. And uh, that has been and will be to the benefit of, um, of both the European Union, other member states, and for, for the UK. Now, of course, uh, the decisions we'll be making, we'll be discussing some of these elements later. I will come back uh, to that discussion, but that was a little bit the introduction from the Commission. The key thing is that this is, this is a hugely sensitive area of, 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 of law that touches on kind of people's everyday lives. Uh, and I think in the wider context of the UK's relationship with Europe that's clearly in flux and kind of undergoing change, um, I think it's right that we use this opportunity to evaluate kind of our level of our cooperation in this area. Um, I mean, I think, it's, as you mentioned, post-Lisbon, we've already opted into some things that involve the Court of Justice. So this, is, this, is, this opt-out thing can't solve that constitutional crisis, issue, sorry, crisis, but issue in one, in one full swoop. Um, but I think it, it does bring that, that issue to a, to, to, to a head in some, for 130 of these things, which is a, lot, a bulk of them. Um, and I think the fact that this was delayed by five years, it, it, um, that was one of, the, one of the underlying reasons why the, the, this is kind of a red line for justice, home affairs, and, and it, 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 one, one, of the, kind of, one of the ways that the government got the Lisbon Treaty through Parliament. Um, and I think we have to realise this is a real thing that's, that, that is, is, it concerns people. I think what the government's problem is that it has no, there is no easy answer to that question. Um, it's going to have to find a way of getting, again, getting this through Parliament um, with the ECJ in there. I think what, what we would urge the government to do is look, look long term and think, do we want to go back towards a more intergovernmental um, level of cooperation um, when you're looking at these kind of these different measures? The problem with the second part of the underlying assumption, which is that we all share the same, the same standards, is that it's not always true in every case. There are, there are problems. Um, it, it's not to criticise member states, but there are economic difficulties, developments need to happen. Uh, and so you get cases where people are sent to <coughs> Uh, prisons, uh, for instance, in, in Lithuania recently there was a prison governor saying, look, we just don't have the funds. Currently the situation is terrible in this prison, but we can't do it. Nevertheless, uh, someone from the UK is extradited to that prison because uh, of this assumption that uh, is required to be made in law that everything is fine uh, and that you can't say no uh, on human rights grounds uh, because the threshold is so so very high. What and we also, say is that it needs to be a more achievable, um, uh, you know, threshold. And you're concerned that Poland, for example, was seeking too many or issuing too many European arrest warrants, seeking too many fugitives because they they were uh, trying to get them for relatively low-level theft. And Absolutely, like that. and um, that, that's the other major problem with the arrest warrant. Now, in the middle of all of this, we then have the huge elephants in the room, and the biggest one of which is the European arrest warrant not working well, uh, which, we, which we've just heard, which obscures everything. Um, but, you know, and I know I'm going on too long. No, no, it's fine, don't worry. But, but if I could just make this mm. point, because it really answers the whole conundrum, mm. which is this. The European arrest warrant has become the totemic thing. Um, I can understand what Stephen has said because it's the philosophical thing about common law and so on. But I'll tell you what my position is so I'm clear. Labour got us into this. Um, and now our position is, to be very clear, is that the European arrest warrant needs reforming and you have to choose whether you don't opt back in and then say that's the way we reform it or you opt back in and you choose to reform it. Now I would opt back in and say that the uh, European supervisory order is a very good way of reforming the European arrest warrant. And as you know, uh, this part of the uh, discussion is looking forward. What are the consequences of the UK uh, deciding to uh, opt out or deciding not to opt out? Um, if it decides not to opt out, what are the chances of reforming um, the existing measures? If it does opt out, how easy will it be 
to opt back into some of the measures on a selective basis. Again, UK has been a very important partner in the law enforcement and judicial cooperation. And uh, it should benefit from that. Uh, we should also benefit the other European countries from that experiences. I think it is in the interest of the UK and of the European Union to rejoin, opt in into as many measures as possible. In that way, the UK can continue to play its very strong role in the EU fight against cross-border crime, terrorism and maintain judicial cooperation in criminal matters. Uh, the Commission will have a role. Uh, for the moment we are not doing anything. We are expecting for the, the coalition to make uh, the decision. We will of course try to cooperate as constructively and, and efficiently uh, as possible, uh, but hoping also from, from a personal point of view that that, that list of opt-in will be very long. Um, there are undoubtedly a great number of measures pre-09 which we would regard as being defunct, repetitious, or unnecessary regulation when they are examined, as it were. I think there are other countries, apart from Britain, that would probably share that view if, if a review could take place of them. Um, I think, as I said, the mood music is very important, but it is absolutely essential that we do not uh, conduct this process um, for the wrong reasons. In other words, if, if we are simply talking about the powers of Europe, and at a very simple level, some politicians look at it in that way, if we're doing that, then this is the wrong area for us to be debating that, I believe. Um, this is an area where there is no doubt whatsoever there are a considerable number of measures of enormous importance to this country in terms of the growing, the rise in crime, major criminality, terrorism, cybercrime in particular, where combining our work, and we're leading, not just combining with other European countries. Europol, you mentioned before, as I said, I mean, Rob Wainwright, the director, is a Brit. Um, we have a Brit running uh, Eurojust at the moment. Uh, we've, got, we've got actually enormous influence uh, in terms of the processes that are being deployed by these operations, and it's benefiting us. My views are firmly, first of all, that we should opt out uh, and do so as soon as possible. Secondly, I believe we should not opt in not opt in to any measures, and I also think uh, that it's a mistake for the current government to have entered into any uh, of the, the 21 measures, 23 now possibly, uh, that you mentioned. About 27. 27, 27, um, are subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court. Our collaboration with our European neighbours should be done uh, uh, on an international plane, uh, under international arrangements, which ultimately uh, uh, we, we hope they'll work well, we hope they'll be satisfactory, but ultimately give us the right to modify them and withdraw from them if they prove to be unsatisfactory. Well, I increasingly um, convinced that, that it's not worth the trouble, hassle, and indeed the risk that you referred to, to opt out, to exercise opt out at all. Um, I note, I think from when you read out Theresa May's comments in October in the House of Commons, from memory, I think you said she quoted three categories, useful, less useful, and defunct. She did not say that any were, any were harmful. And um, uh, so, I mean, I think I very much agree with what, um, what Timothy said. And indeed, I think with your forensic skill, Josh, you came to the nub of the, of, of the question, why bother? Um, there is no way that the Commission, which is completely overloaded with work, is going to take any member state uh, to the court for failure to implement some, uh, you know, f rather weak 1990s um, uh, joint action or something. It's, it's just not going to happen. Most of uh, 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 the, the important ones are going to be repealed and replaced, and the others can be left to wither on the vine. So I don't buy this argument that some huge threat, and as you've said, if the court was such a threat, why has the UK opted in uh, to so many measures post-Lisbon? Uh,